everyone, and our special guest today, uh, Dr. Marla Cunningham. Oh my goodness, she's an amazing lady. I've taken her course myself, and it is fabulous how she has brought science and yoga together in such an easy, understandable manner. Um, Dr. Marla, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Well, today we're going to talk about minding the mind and what the mind is all about, what Raj Yoga really focuses on. And it starts with Sutra 2 and Sri Patanjali's uh, Yoga Science. It says, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodha, Tada Drastue Swarupe Vastanam, which means the restraints of the modification of the mind stuff is yoga. Then the seer abides in its own true nature. So what does this mean? I'm going to explain it very simply, and then we're going to have a long chat with Dr. Mala here. The restraints of the modifications of the mind stuff. What is yoga first? Uniting with your higher self, your spirit, the who you are. Who am I really when I lose this body? What am I? Am I soul? Am I spirit? Where do I come from? The great questions in life. Yoga is to connect with that spirit. It means union with that one or with God or whatever you want to name it. While we're here on earth, this is our mission. This is why we're always searching, looking. But what stops us from con you know, connecting with this force? Because we constantly forget that we are much more than this body and this mind, but we need this mind and we need this body to realize this without the body and mind, there's no work to do. And if we have no work to do, where would we be? So <laughs> these are our questions. And Sri Patanjali tells us, when you learn to restrain, restrain, hold back all those crazy thoughts, minding your mind, Learning to look at your thoughts, minding it. What happens? It becomes a silence. There's a silent moment when you just hold back. And that's why we do pranayama. Take a deep breath. Stop. And then when you learn to do that, there is a silence, there is a stillness, there is peace. And then you see your real nature is peace. And that's our goal. And when you can see you are the witness, oh, who is the witness? Is it really this body and this person? Suddenly you're able to witness all the thoughts in your mind, the good ones and the bad ones. And by learning, Hold back those vrittis, those thought patterns. You have a silent space. And with the constant practice of meditation, this space grows and we connect with what we call consciousness. Nirvana, samadhi, whatever you want to call that. Connection with God, the energy within, higher self. And the feeling is stillness. In the Psalms, as it says, be still and know that I am God. So today we have Dr. Mala. Hey. Uh, now you're here with us. And uh, well, you know, uh, Mala, I met you through our beloved master, Gurudev, who is one of the greatest spiritual masters of our generation, I would say. Now, I have met you also uh, through neuroscience, your courses in cardiac yoga and neuroscience. So tell me, as a scientist, as a devotee, how do you blend the two in your work, in the, your medical work in the world? How do you blend it and how do you, how do you bring this essence of spirit to life? A loaded question. 
loaded question and a beautiful question. And before, before we start, I just want to say how happy I am and honored to be here with all of you today. I recognize so many of you. And I just want to get such an important piece of business out of the way, which is to say happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. <laughs> Because I am Irish, and it's an important day. <laughs> and, <I have> my <laughs> and I believe one of our people here, Audrey, is Irish, and she was celebrating all day on the beach. <laughs> yes, and actually, I go by my first name today, which is Maureen. So okay. Maureen. Yeah, once a year. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what a beautiful question. And... When you asked that question, Nalini, I was reminded of what Carl Sagan, who is an amazing scientist and has passed, as well as Einstein, and both of them said similar quotes, which is something to the effect that science without spirituality is nothing, and spirituality without science is not as propped up. Those weren't the exact words, but that was the idea that the two disciplines go hand in hand. And at some point, beyond all the theory and all the cognitions that we go through with these type of things, these two disciplines meet and are blended and literally are one. And it's just so beautiful. But that doesn't mean much to us on an everyday basis. Like, what does this look like on an everyday basis? And that's where I like to go with these topics. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take 60 seconds and have everybody do a little technique. And I just want to show you something. Okay. Is everybody okay to, to do this? We'll just everybody will be so ready to do this. <laughs> A little something that, that will bring home a point. So what I'd like you to do is if you could lace your hands behind your head and just be comfortable and turn your head to the right and just have a little pressure against your hands, not too much, and just wait there until you take a deep breath, sigh, or yawn. So just relax, a little pressure, not much. And then let's slowly go over to the left side. And again, just a little pressure against your hands. And just wait there until you sigh, yawn, or take a deep breath. And let's come back to center and just relax. So chances are most all of you, sometimes it takes a little longer to activate. Um, so sometimes it takes people a little longer holding before they activate a deep breath, a yawn, or a sigh. But chances are most all of you did one of those three things, yes? Just you do thumbs up or shake your head or something, yeah. Yeah, so what we're doing here is we're activating, we're going in directly and we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system, the ventral vagal complex, which helps relax the body and also activates calming hormones. There's only two processes that happen in the system. One is we're either activating action-oriented hormones or stress hormones. If we go too far down the continuum, they become stress hormones. If we go too far the other way in tamasic energy and parasympathetic overdrive, then we're activating immobilization. Okay, so we don't want to go to those extremes we want to hit the parasympathetic nervous system, the ventral vagal complex, which is sattvic energy. And we have to have a range of sattvic energy. So there's a little activity, a little relaxation, and it's a perfect blend of yoga, of union. So when we talk about science and spirituality, 
my passion is neuroscience and how we can understand yoga through the lens of neuroscience. Because neuroscience explains why and how yoga works. And that's what I love about the blending of these two disciplines. So just one more thought, and then we, we can go back and forth, have a conversation. We all, as teachers, how many are teachers here? Can you raise your hands? Many of you are teachers. So we're all taught as teachers, as well as yoga students, to do the three-part deep breath. But nobody necessarily explains why is that so important and what does it do to the body? Okay, we know it relaxes the body, but why does it relax the body? So the explanation is really simple. When we take a three-part deep breath, we expand what are called the pulmonary C fibers within the lungs. And when that happens, when those C fibers are expanded, they release a neurotransmitter called bradykinin. Bradykinin's job in the body is to signal the parasympathetic nervous system to activate. When the parasympathetic nervous system activates, we relax. It's that simple, you see? But understanding why and how yoga works, to me, became really, really important to my yoga practice and to my, just my personal practice. So, yeah. So I just wanted to share those few thoughts with you. And so Nalini, did, did, what are your thoughts? Well, I love that because, you know, that is why we do pranayama and we connect with all these uh, nervous system, uh, the, the nerve meridians and centers, our brain stem. Well, there's so much in it, as you know, we talk about Pratipaksha Bhagna, and all of it just marries together so beautifully. And uh, so tell me, you know, uh, Mala, when you are in the world, you know, because you work with medics and you work with different types of people who may not be spiritual, how do you, how do they deal with your spiritual side, like for example, uh, when you, or do you mention Swami Satchitananda and your work with him? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. And I try, I, that, that's actually one of my top priorities is to be respectful of other people's religious paths or spiritual paths, or if they're atheists. Uh, I, I, my top priority, no matter what organization or uh, business uh, corporation I'm in or whatever, my top priority is respect and not forcing anything on anybody. So what I tell people is I, I really just focus mostly on here are some self-care strategies, tools, techniques. If you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling lethargic, depressed, anxious, having panic attacks, if you have an eating disorder, if you just find yourself in this sort of tumultuous, tumultuous process with relationships, here are some ideas about what you can do to bring your nervous system back into balance, bring your body back into balance, and then if I'm with that person or corporation long enough, I might segue and say respectfully that whatever your religious or spiritual beliefs, when we're in this meditation moment, if you feel like you want to integrate that within yourself, that's beautiful and certainly very acceptable. But I don't push or force anything on anybody and I'm, and, and I just, I don't, I feel very strongly about that, just to be so respectful of what other people's paths are. Because my job, if, you know, if I want to even call it that, my dharma is, is to really help people have techniques and strategies and formulas for navigating life. You know, that, that to me is my bottom line. Yeah, I love the part of respect. You know, I'm constantly telling my students as well, 
please, we are not here to convert anyone. We're just not. We're just here to share our peace. We're here to share, if we found a little bit of peace, to share it and to, to show them how to heal themselves in difficult times. That's all we can do. But it's up to them. It really is. And you know, really, really, for me, this is why I love Swami such a Dananda so much. And the way he taught us is truth is one, paths are many. Yes. And with that strong foundation, when people are so different from us, we can really accept the differences and still transmit that truth and, and the work of the minding the mind, you know, through different uh, jargon. We can easily do that because when we have that foundation, it makes us so strong in love that it doesn't matter what people really think. Like you said, the job is to just do the job. Your dharma, your swad dharma, you know, and they come to you for peace and, you know, and that's what we, we are there to transmit. So that was great. Uh, tell us something about uh, neuroscience and, uh, you know, how the neuroplasticity works and give us some information on that. Something about neuroscience that, I mean, obviously that's such a big topic, but I will share some, a few foundational concepts, which I think are just so exciting. So within the last 20 years, neuroscience just has exploded. And the reason that it exploded is because of the advent of new technology the fMRIs, the QEEGs, and so on, enabled scientists to be able to see into the brain in a whole new way. We were able to see what was lighting up under certain mood states or stress or whatever was going on, we could see different parts of the brain lighting up. So what happened is many scientists, like for example, Richard Davidson, who is out of the University of Wisconsin in Madison, he runs the Center for Healthy Minds. And I would highly encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to please feel free to visit his web website. He's one of the foremost scientists, neuroscientists in the world, who's looking at mindfulness meditation and yoga and mood states and what's going on in the brain under different conditions. And he was the one that brought over the Dalai Lama to his research lab and many of the Dalai Lama's monks mm -hmm. and they into their brains as they were telling them different things or having them look at different pictures, stress pictures, relaxation pictures, and what was going on in the minds of those monks as they were looking at different videos and different scenarios. The thing about neuroscience that was discovered that no one understood before was that the, the brain had plasticity, which means that up until the day we die, we can lay down new neural pathways in the brain. So in other words, just briefly, the amygdala in the brain is the part of the brain that assesses threat in the environment. So you're at, let's say you walk into a party and let's say that you're not really comfortable in crowds, you're not really comfortable going in where there's a lot of people, so immediately, if you were in an fMRI at that point, what we would see is your amygdala would be flaring because uh -huh. you're assessing threat in the environment, okay? So uh -huh. when a person is under chronic stress or there's been unresolved childhood trauma or a trauma of any kind in, in our lives, which everybody has had trauma, that's but how right. we then navigate it is a different concept and a different story. But what happens is that what they found, which is so fascinating, is that those individuals who were in trauma situations or not recovered, their amygdalas were much larger 
than non-traumatized individuals, which meant that more neural pathways were going in and out of the signaling process of the amygdala, signaling the prefrontal cortex, signaling the limbic system to activate as if there were a literal stress response, as if there was a lion attacking them at the moment, you see? So what we found out in doing various different studies is that when we meditate and when we do pranayama and when we do the formulas and the techniques and the strategies, the one study they did found that after eight weeks of a mindfulness meditation course, the amygdala shrunk. Wow, that's really great. Huh? Yeah. It really meant that the neural pathways, because they weren't used as much, began to just wither away. So it's actually called neuronal Darwinism. Hmm. The strongest, yeah, the strongest survive those we use get stronger. So that takes us right to the whole concept of what, our, what are our patterns? Are we thinking negative thoughts? Are we being self-judgmental? Are we being critical of ourselves? Because all you're doing is strengthening those neural pathways. And all you're doing is strengthening the amygdala and the threat process and the threat centers in the brain. So we have to be able to slowly and lovingly rewire, redirect. And we know that we can do that. We know we can lay down new neural pathways in the brain. And there's just one story that I would love to share with you. Several months ago, I was watching a documentary on Vincent Van Gogh, and I'm sure you all know who he is, just literally one of the most influential uh, painters in, in Western art. I mean, just an amazing individual. While he was alive, though, he was not famous. He suffered greatly. I mean, horrible, horrible suffering uh, financially, and certainly his mental health was was really really bad he had very severe mental health issues and in this documentary that i was watching they said he, vincent van gogh said five words which made me just sit up and go oh my god that's amazing that's yoga and i just was amazed at how he was able to navigate his severe depression, severe anxiety, and just his, his whole process. And what he said was, those five words were, I paint to not think. Wow. Wow. Yes. Was, oh my God. That's what about Shabbana. Not only is it that, but it's also two other formulas and concepts which are so important in yoga. And those two other concepts are sankalpa. He had an intention to not think and get caught in the looping of his negative thinking and his suffering. He had an intention to get out of it. And then the other piece, which I think is so important in the, in the yoga practices, is dristi. Just having that concentrated mindset. Dristi, yes, it's, it's gazing and constant, you know, gazing with the eyes and such, but it's more than that. It's, it's, a, it's the capacity to take our concentration and focus it. And that's what Vincent van Gogh did. For so many years, he was navigating his suffering by basically practicing these three yoga techniques, which I find fascinating. Whoa, Dr. Mala, because uh, I don't know if you know this, but I was in university studying to be an art therapist. And yeah, and, and uh, that was my dream, to be an art therapist, using all the arts, music, dance. I, I used to teach dance. 
And in my work, uh, when I had a dance school in Gibraltar, I used to get my students to create their own stories. You know, I would say, for example, uh, you're feeling really depressed. Now, I want you to dance like you're really depressed. And then do the dance, their own, and it feels so much better afterwards, you know? So I, I am such a great believer of, you know, when you mention Van Gogh, by the way, he is my favorite artist. And do you, and you know this, the song Starry, Starry Night? It's written for him, right? So if mean, you listen to the lyrics, it's absolutely beautiful. But yeah, so creativity. And, you know, if you read Gurdjieff's book, Beyond Words, he talks about he and art makes heart. And, you know, many times, and I'm sure you do this too, when people have a mindset and, you know, in, in Spanish, there's a lovely word, comer el coco, eating your brains up, you know? <laughs> they say the best, you know, I tell them the best thing to do is actually to dive into, because sometimes they can't, they just really cannot meditate. I'm sure you've seen this. And they can't sit still. But if you give them a hobby, stamps even, you know, or even internet or dancing or singing, or, and it does, it it. It keeps the mind out of trouble. So I, it's wonderful that you mentioned that. It really is. Not only does it keep the mind out of trouble, but neuroscience explains what's happening in the body to keep the mind out of trouble. Brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah. the, the amygdala. So when I'm painting, for example, and I focus totally on my painting, what happens to the amygdala? It does it just keep quiet? It's like what's beautiful about what yoga, um, what's beautiful about what neuroscience has discovered is that mental and emotional intentionality lays down the neural pathways in the brain. And that's what's so beautiful about what they've discovered is that we have the capacity to change our lives, format our lives, direct our brain to run the course through a particular wiring pattern and not necessarily through a stress pattern. So we have the capacity by doing the yoga practices and breathing practices and practicing dristi and sankalpa and pradabhakshabhava, we have the capacity to literally change the wiring in our brain. So yes, the amygdala starts to not activate. It's, if it's not being used as much, the neural pathways start to wither. Only that which is absolutely needed stays versus an overactivation of it being used all the time. Mm, interesting. So what about feels like, you know, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's? Could we apply, you know, uh, the same thing with people who are starting to get dementia? Tell me something about that. Well, yeah, and it's funny you should mention that because literally just three days ago, I was watching a an interview between Dr. Deepak Chopra and Dr. Dean Ornish. And I think I think it actually was through, you all probably get the Interval Yoga magazine. Yes. yes. Part of the new magazine where Primanjali had posted um, a video of the two of them uh, being interviewed. I think uh, Deepak was interviewing Dean Ornish. So Dean Ornish's current research is using the yoga principles of Interval Yoga mostly and he's doing research on dementia and Alzheimer's right now. So his research isn't quite published and finished yet, but it sounded very, very promising. And as many of you may know, Dean was the pioneer, really, who brought medical yoga to heart disease. And back in the 80s and 90s, using a yoga-based model, he was actually able to reverse heart disease. Oh. Well, Dr. Dean Onish has done some incredible work, and I was very privileged to meet him quite a few times with Swami Sachidananda. 
and uh, you know, listen to some of his lectures at the ashram. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. No, I mentioned dementia because I do work with people getting older. And when they complain about dementia, normally their state of mind is victimhood, you know? Uh, they're always like going back into why me question or uh, the brain is stuck on a certain thought, but, but, but why did this have to happen, Ellie? But why this has to happen? And I have noticed when they actually start to rewire, I give them homework, I give them a list of positive affirmations that they have to, they want to see me again. <laughs> <laughs> repeat you know at least five times a day with the uh, breathing techniques together with the walking with the exercising and otherwise don't bother because and when they do they actually come back and tell me that they feel you know they are starting the memory starting to work again you know I don't have the foundation and the you know medical knowledge like you but just working with people has has taught me so much about how the brain works. This is why I love your work, because you can literally tell people, hey guys, this is what's do it. And you show us those pictures when you did in the course about what happens to the brain when they're meditating. And when people can see visuals, then they want to work harder. Have you found that? Visuals help them. Yeah, I just think anything that can motivate to heal and understand themselves and to feel better. It, it's just so important, whatever we can use, whether it's visuals or books or dance or artwork, I think all of those things are so, so important. Uh, Marla, tell us something about your work with the uh, University of Virginia. Sure, yeah. Um, there is... Well, actually, let me maybe back up and say this first, which is that this whole field has exploded. There is, there is just, and I venture to say this is probably worldwide, but in particular in the U.S., there is not a major university in the U.S. that is not implementing or researching or developing theoretical orientations around the whole field of mindfulness meditation and yoga and medical yoga. It is literally absolutely common. And, you know, so much research money has been put toward mindfulness meditation and, you know, research labs. It's just mind blowing that, that this whole field has exploded and it's just very, very exciting. So some of the things, a, better world. a better world. Oh gosh, yes. And, you know, they're bringing what's called compassionate care into nursing schools, into the medical school, really across all nine schools at the University of Virginia. But again, it's not just at the University of Virginia, it's everywhere. It is literally everywhere. There's conferences all the time on, on all of these fields. So anyway, some of the things that are happening at the University of Virginia is that we got a 26 million, and now it's even a little bit more, a million dollar grant um, to open what's called the Contemplative Sciences Center. And if you're interested, please feel free to go on to the University of Virginia website and put in Contemplative Sciences Center. They have a Contemplative Science Center. She's just going to write it on the chat box. <laughs> Perfect. Um, they have a lot of free things there in terms of meditation times. They have yoga classes all day long from in the morning all through the evening that are free to the entire student community. Anybody actually, it's free for the um, Charlottesville community also. So free yoga classes, free meditation, lectures. They have people on no names coming all the time giving lectures. So that's one thing that's going on at the university. There's also another organization there called um, the Compassionate Care Initiative, and that's run through the nursing school. You can also go on their website, lots of free things there. 
Uh, same thing, they offer free meditation, free yoga classes to any, everybody across the entire university community, academic community, as well as the Charlottesville community. Um, they're doing programming and support a lot for nurses around compassionate care initiatives and helping nurses not feel so burned out. Um, so, so many different things, um, brown bag lunches in medical yoga, research projects across the board, academic courses in medical yoga. I established some courses in the medical school as well as the uh, nursing school, and then also established some courses um, for continuing education for nurses and doctors to familiarize themselves more with the whole idea of medical yoga. So that's a little bit about what's going on. There's a lot more, but that kind of gives you a little, a little peek in things that are happening. But again, what's exciting is that this is not just indicative of the University of Virginia. It's all universities, I think probably all over the world at this point. You know, and maybe some are a little ahead of others, but it's just so exciting what's happening in the plethora of research coming out regarding yoga and mindfulness and meditation. And, there are and wow, is it needed? Our world really needs that right now. I think we need to bring you back to Europe more often. <laughs> to run more courses here. We need to put you into hospitals and businesses and get you here again once we can travel. Uh, you have a lot to offer our world. I have talked to most of my students and I always advise them uh, to take your course. I'm looking at the chat box right now and there's a question to you uh, and it's from Ruth uh, from Portugal. And she says, it seems that today that more people suffer from dementia. If this is true, what do you think is the reason? Oh, goodness. I honestly, I, I think dementia is a very complicated process. I think that for some people, there's a genetic component to the onset of dementia. And I think for other people, I think lifestyle factors play a pretty dramatic role in mm -hmm. terms of their diet, alcohol intake, smoking, stress, some of those kinds of things. So I, there's so much that we don't know about dementia. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, Dean Ornish, I think, is doing an amazing job with, again, using a yoga-based model to see the effects on dementia. And again, he hasn't revealed anything related to the results of his research yet, but it should be coming out very soon. And I think there's gonna be a huge, huge interest in this field. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, Mala, tell me something about your relationship with Sri Swami Satchidananda. Oh, goodness, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the first, thing that comes to my mind about Gurudev is that I think two things. One, when I first met him, I was, I was with another yoga organization and he was coming to a conference in Chicago. I lived in the Chicago area at the time and I was chosen to pick him up at the airport and I was so excited. I was so young. I was so surprised that they even let me pick him up. You know, he was such a luminary. And uh, so anyway, I think the thing that struck me so deeply about Gurdjieff was two things. One is, is it was how gentle he was. Yeah, it wasn't he? Mind and how mindful he was. Oh my goodness, just mind blowing. And how he would notice the smallest thing of somebody getting pushed away or something. And then he would go to the person getting pushed away and he would say, come, come, hi, you know, how are you, what is your name? So loving, so I mean, just amazing, the awareness number one. And then number two, his sense of humor was just 
so amazing. Like when you think about an Indian guru type thing, you know, some people have the impression of someone who's serious and scholarly or whatever. And Gurudev wasn't like that at all. He would use puns and jokes and just help us relate to the yoga teachings via contemporary ideas and examples. And I think that's why people were so attracted to him and his teachings because he made the teachings so simple, you know, adapt, adjust, accommodate, um, you know, just do good, be good, just simple, easy. And, and I've picked that up, to be honest with you. And one of the things I wanted to share with you today is that in the morning when I wake up, I think that's such a critical time for the yoga practices and where our mind goes. Because when we first come into consciousness, people will sometimes go to depressive thoughts, they'll go to worry, they'll go to fear, and that, those, you know, whatever, five minutes as we're coming into consciousness, it's so important to have a template put your brain and your thoughts into. So here's a template that I use every single morning that I wake up. My first process is, I use the acronym KISS, K-I-S. What am I going to do today to be kind to myself, to inspire myself or to strengthen myself? What is my sankalpa for kindness? And again, it's to myself because if I have it in me, then I have the capacity to automatically, without even have to think about it, to give it to others. So it has to be about me first and how I fill up my own vessel first, and then I can serve so much better. The second part of this would be to ask ourselves throughout your day, like even right now, just to ask yourself and identify what have been your three best moments so far today? Has it been having a beautiful cup of tea and looking out the window and you just felt this softness and relaxation? Was it snuggling with your cat or your puppy or your partner? Or was it reading something inspiring? What have been your three best moments so far today? And if we can do that every day, we'll be laying down new neural pathways in the brain. And when we think these things, if you were under an fMRI right now, we would see the left prefrontal cortex lighting up. And that's the seat of positive emotions. The right side of the prefrontal cortex is more about worry or alarm or fear, things like that. And I never say or tell people that you shouldn't have those feelings because that's part of being human. We have to have the capacity to alert or be aware of danger. So that has to light up. It has its function. You say, yes, certainly we want to bring and light up that other part, those other parts of our brain. The ventral striatum in the brain is the reward circuitry in the brain. So how do we activate those things? And I'll take you through maybe 30 seconds, if we have the time. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, practice that will activate calming hormones in your body. So again, we only have two things going on. We either have stress and activation, or we have calming hormones. You can't have both at the same time. It's like the gas pedal or the brake. The gas pedal is our sympathetic nervous system. The brake is our parasympathetic nervous system. It's going on millions of times a day on all sorts of subtle levels, but we want to go in and take control of that. 
we want to have some control. Much of it is autonomic, but the part we can control, we want to go in and control it. Okay. And that means that instead of fighting with Pradabhaksha Bhavana and cognitive revamping, and we're fighting and fighting and we're trying to say the mantra to get back into a better place and it just isn't working. Have any of you had that experience? I, I have. You know, it's like the mind just starts activating and, and we're like in that blah moment, right? Those are stress hormones. So what do we do? How do we put money in our bank account so that it's available when something hits us? Or when something hits us, what do we do to start to calm it? So I'm going to show you just one simple breath technique that is so powerful and so easy to do. Okay. So are you ready? Everybody ready? What I'd like you to do is we want to make room for the diaphragm. So just look to the so you can close your eyes if you want or leave them just gazed downward, whatever is comfortable for you. And what we're going to do is, again, we're going to activate endorphin, endorphin release in your system. So if you could bring your attention to the base of your spine and just focus there for just a moment and let the breath be smooth and soft versus jerky or shallow. Okay, now without the breath, I simply want you to go from the base of the spine through the middle of the spinal cord up to the crown of your head and into the brain. And then go back down to the base of the spinal cord. And just do that for a moment. So what we're developing here is called proprioception and interoception. It means a connection inward to the systems in our body. And as yoga practitioners, we want to develop deeper proprioception and interoception. Okay, let's bring our attention back down to the bottom. And on your next inhalation, go up the spinal cord to the crown of your head, hold the breath inhaled, squeeze the pelvic floor upward, and press your shoulders downward, hold the breath inhaled. Softly release, mind goes down the spinal cord and just rest for a moment. So while you're resting, I'll repeat it again. Don't do it, I'll just explain. We're gonna inhale up the spinal cord to the crown of the head, and we're gonna squeeze the shoulders in and down, and we're gonna bear down. We're gonna pull up the pelvic floor, and we're gonna hold the breath inhaled. Okay, so we'll do it again. When you're ready, inhale up the spinal cord to the crown of the head, hold the breath inhaled, pull the pelvic floor up, shoulders in and down, and bear down slightly. Hold the breath inhaled. Release. And now do it two more times on your own. If you want to add the chin lock and bring the chin toward the chest as you hold the breath inhaled, you're welcome to do that. And letting the breath return to normal and just let the system settle and feel the effects of that powerful mechanism, that powerful breath technique. And then lazily open your eyes and gently coming back. 
and just take a moment to observe. So you don't want to change anything. You don't want to be in a hurry. You just want to take a moment and observe. So when someone is having a panic attack and they're in an emergency room, at least in the US, but probably other places, they do what's called the, let me just make, yeah, the Valsalva maneuver is what it's called. And the Valsalva maneuver is this, which is really a yogic breathing technique to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. When we activate the parasympathetic nervous system, we activate a variety of different calming hormones. And I use the acronym DOSE to identify the four calming hormones, which is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, okay? so. If we go in and activate these hormones, without a doubt, our stress hormones go down. The cortisol, the uh, adrenaline, the noradrenaline, all those stress hormones, they can't, the gas pedal and the brake can't be on at the same time. One or the other is going to happen. So we have the capacity to impact on and go in and create what we want in life. And the more we do that, that's what lays down those new neural, new neural pathways in our brain, you see? So it comes full circle using these powerful yoga techniques to create our, our reality and create what we want in life. And that's the beauty of doing the yoga practices. Wonderful. That was wonderful. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mala. Uh, Dr. Mala, do you have time for a couple of questions from the chat box? And well, Selena asks, what would be the best single bit of advice you would offer healthcare workers to prevent burnout? Ah, well, honestly, I think there isn't one single piece of advice. I think that especially now with the, the horrendous impact on healthcare workers, you know, the, the, the concept of self-care is so great. And yet it's so hard for many of them to actually even implement self-care techniques. But I think all through the day, if I was going to say one thing, it would be all through the day to take mindfulness moments, mindfulness self-care moments. So it might be walking from one room to the next, one patient to the next, relax the shoulders, relax the face, take some deep breaths, and do moments of self-care. You know, that's, that's about all we can do right now is, is to, to really help these healthcare workers have these mindfulness, mindfulness moments throughout their day. And I'm a big advocate of massage and a big advocate of hot oil baths. And I'm also a big advocate of just simply doing the yoga practices, even if it's for five minutes. So... I don't think there's any silver bullet. There's no simple answer. It's just bringing self-care to ourselves throughout the day. Thank you, Dr. Mala. I have one more question for you. Uh, sure. Rachel, uh, in the morning, first five minutes, could you repeat a positive affirmation as an option also? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I do, and some of you may also do this, is I have my iPad on pretty much from the time I wake up to the time, it's probably going 24 hours a day sometimes, playing the Gayatri Mantra. And sometimes I can't hear it, but it's still playing because maybe I'm having guests or clients or, you know, whatever. But I think the more we can spiritualize our environment, 
the more it's going to affect us vibrationally. In every room in my home and my office, my car, wherever I am, there is something inspiring. The yantra, a picture, you know, a little uh, maybe Buddha statue or Ganesh statue, everywhere in, in my life is something in front of me to spiritualize and remind, spiritualize my life and remind me to stay connected in. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mala. Thank you for joining us today. It's been great to see you. And again, I haven't seen you for so long. Do we have like two minutes? Because I would love to share a powerful story, if, if that's okay, if you have. We have two minutes. Okay, perfect. Yes, please do. And yeah. Love to share this story with you because I learned so much from it and was so inspired by it. So there was you, and this is a true story, by the way. There is a, there was a person a couple years ago who successfully crossed the Antarctic solo by himself. Now, that's just an impossible thing to do, just about. It was about 925 miles through horrible whiteout conditions, freezing cold, blizzard, 40 below zero, 60 below zero with wind chill, and they're pulling a 250 pound sled behind him for supplies and things like that. 925 miles. It took him about 56 days to complete this solo trek. When he got to the finish line and they were, after a bit, were interviewing him and so on, he said the most inspiring thing that just spoke to me so deeply. Two years previous to him completing and succeeding this trek, one of his dear friends named Henry Worsley, attempted to do the same thing, but he failed and he died 30 miles from the finish line. So this person, Lou Rood is his name, R-U-D-D, when he successfully finished it, what he did was he had configured that if his friend Harry had added 11 more steps each day, he wouldn't have died 30 miles from the finish line. Wow. He would have completed it. So what Lou did is he added, no matter how exhausted he was, no matter how tired and freezing and cold and hungry he was, every single day in honor of his friend, Henry Worsley, Henry Worsley, he added 11 steps to his daily trek. So I just wanted to share that story with you that no matter how tired you are, no matter how angry and upset or depressed and exhausted and stressed you are, please do your yoga practices every day, even if they're one minute of yoga. So that was, that's what I would want to end with, is just have that inspiration to do those 11 more steps like he did for his dear friend. Uh, I love that story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. You're welcome. Even one minute a day will make such a difference. Thank you, Doctor. It's been a great, great having you.